Hey guys, it's Mrs. Invest. What's up? I hope you are having a great start to the summer. It's not snowing anymore, right? So like small wins. If you landed on this video, you're probably interested in buying your first stocks in Canada. And you know, everybody says invest your money, buy stocks, go in the stock market. But like, how do you actually get started? You know, if you don't have somebody in your family or a close friend to show you the ropes who has their own portfolio to kind of show you how to get started, it can seem like this black hole, this like abyss, and you don't even know where to begin. And with my channel and my videos, I'm really into how to videos and showing Showing people how to actually do things. So in this video today, I'm going to show you how to actually buy your first stocks in Canada and get yourself set up on the way to creating your own stock market investment portfolio. So without further ado, let's get started step by step with step number one. So step number one, believe it or not, is not to have money. Step number one is to pick a brokerage. Now, what's a brokerage? Well, a brokerage is basically an institution that's gonna connect you with the stock market to allow you to purchase shares of stock and assets. As far as picking a brokerage, there's two main broad categories. You have the Canadian banks and you have the online brokerages. So between the two broad categories, there are pros and cons uh, between each of them. And within the categories, there are pros and cons between the different institutions within each category. But if you're looking at just the difference between opening with the Canadian banks versus an online broker like you know Quest Trader Wealth Simple, I'd say the biggest difference is if you open your investment account with the bank that you already do your online banking with, the biggest benefit there is that your cash transfers or transferring money between your banking and your investing tends to be a little bit quicker than if you're transferring it outside to a different institution. And so on the other side, you have the online brokerages like Quest Trade and Wealth Simple. And I'd say the biggest benefit of these are that they're pretty much catered to like a younger audience. The websites are really hip, the customer service is good they have an online chat you can pretty much get help on demand the accounts are also really easy to open so I think my quest trade account took me like five minutes to open literally anyhow in order to get started you're gonna to have to pick one of these institutions and open an account with them another thing you really want to pay attention to regardless of who you open with especially as a beginner are the commission fees this is what you're going to pay in order to buy and sell uh, shares of stock at the beginning. If you're just getting started, you know, you might ha not have a lot of money at the start. And so the commission fees can really eat into your ability to buy more shares. So that's something to look at as well. Just when you're on their website, look at what they're charging for commission fees and then compare it to the other, some of the other brokerages and then go from there. If you want to see my breakdown of what I think are the best brokerages in Canada, I made a video on that and I will link it in the description below. Okay. And step two, after you've picked a broker, is you have to open an investment account and if you're doing your own investing this means you need to open what's called a self-directed investment account now in Canada there are three different accounts that you can open in order to invest in the first is the TFSA if you're just getting started this is a no-brainer open a TFSA the only requirements are that you have to be 18 and you have to have a valid social insurance number if you meet those two criteria and you don't have a TFSA open, open a TFSA, there is no downside. In the TFSA, any gains you make, any dividends, any money you make is completely tax-free. The second account you want to consider opening is your RRSP, and this is your retirement account. Now, the requirements for this account are, there's no age requirement, but the requirement is that you have to have a job and you have to have income and file a tax return for that income tax. If you do that, then you can um, then you can open an RRSP. Now, there the RRSP is still really tax advantageous in that while the money is in there growing, there are no taxes. It's only when you're an old lady or an old man when you take the money out that you eventually have to pay tax on it. So it's not tax free, it's tax deferred. So not quite as good as the TFSA in terms of tax savings, but still really good. And the third type of account is a non registered account or a taxable account it's also called and the requirements here are the same as the TFSA you need to be 18 years old with a valid social insurance number any investments that you have in here that generate income whether it's capital gains dividends distributions anything is taxable um, on your income tax at the end of the year 
But if you've already maxed out your TFSA and your RRSP investment accounts, then the taxable account is the next place to go to be able to invest with. Now, since we're Canadians, we use the wonderful CAD or the Canadian dollar. So when you open this account, it's the default is going to be the Canadian dollar trading account. And depending on which institution you pick, it's gonna be a little bit different um, um, in terms of how to open a US dollar trading side. So you'll have to look with your specific institution, but you might have to fill out a little bit more paperwork in order to open a US dollar trading account uh, within your investment account. And that allows you to hold US dollars in cash and uh, buy US listed assets. You can still buy US listed assets in most Canadian accounts, but it's very inefficient because with each transaction or each purchase, there is currency conversion fees because you cannot hold US dollars in a Canadian dollar trading account. So when all is said and done, what you're probably gonna see on your screen on your computer is something that says TFSA, Canadian side, TFSA, US dollar side. Once you have that open, then you are ready for step number three. Step three is acquire funds and transfer them into the investment account that you just opened. So this is typically called a cash transfer and depending on which institution you've picked to invest with, the steps are gonna be a little bit different. I have a tutorial on my channel for CIBC Investors Edge, how to open an account and use the account. I'll link that below as well. Anyways, just check the description. I'm gonna be linking a lot of relevant things below of other videos that I've made but typically what you're gonna want to do is go from your checking account have money in your checking account and then send it over to your investment account and step number four is you're ready to start purchasing stocks ETFs and investing in assets now this is not financial advice, this is just my own personal opinion, but I think as a beginner, your best bet is to start out with mature companies or investing in shares of stock of mature companies that are not very volatile. In Canada, these would be things like the Canadian banks, telecoms, and utility companies. The reason for this is as a beginner, you don't know what your risk tolerance is, Maybe you think you know, but you probably don't actually know, meaning you don't know how much pain you can tolerate in terms of paper losses before you panic sell. And I think that starting out with stocks that are less volatile, meaning the price doesn't fluctuate a lot, also meaning when you buy it, the chances of it dropping in price dramatically soon after you buy it, is lower and this can really build up your confidence when you're just getting started now you're probably not going to get the greatest returns this way you know you're not going to be posting on wall street bets that you made a million dollars in three months but your chances of you losing everything that you put in at the beginning is also greatly reduced this way and i see a lot of people online start out investing by jumping into hype momentum stocks um, and you can just see this really all over twitter by the way follow me on twitter where i post some of um just general thoughts and also um, sometimes I post my trades as well if I can remember to do it. I see people like all over Twitter being like, I just opened a Robinhood account and I wanna buy AMC or I'm gonna buy GME. And like they think they're investing, but what they're really doing is just speculating, jumping in on hype. And they're, most of those people are probably gonna end up losing in the end. And I don't know why that is that beginners tend to gravitate towards the riskiest most volatile assets that are out there at the time and you know whatever the current soup of the day is like at one point it was nicola and you know now it's amc and gme a few months from now it's going to be something else there's always a soup of the day and i like to say ask what it is but never order it so kind of starting off boring honestly i think is the way to go and as you build your knowledge and as you learn more and more you can branch out from there and another really great way to start i think rather than picking individual stocks is to buy index ETFs. So buy the broad market. I do have a video on my channel called my top three ETFs to hold for life. I'll link that down below as well. These are the types of investments that you hold for life. And so as a beginner, if you're jumping in and purchasing these, uh, these shares and you know you're gonna be holding them till the day you die or until you know, you're very old, psychologically, it does help you to weather the volatility at the beginning because you know the reality is it's the stock market you could possibly buy the stock right before a massive correction even though it's a you know safe quote safe company there's no reason not to start just because you don't have a lot of knowledge it's kind of like that person that you know wants to be fit before they go to the gym you can start with a small amount of money and as you're building knowledge 
you are acquiring more funds and you're becoming a more knowledgeable investor. Um, you know, the last thing you want to do is just not invest at all until you have a ton of money and then you're um, you know, a, an un, uninformed person with a lot of money that's like a recipe for disaster. It's much better to know nothing and have a little bit of money because as you build money, you build knowledge and the two rise at the same time. But my TLDR on what to buy as a beginner is to avoid hype momentum stocks because it's probably not going to go so well. Mike, it's going to go well for somebody and they're going to post on Wall Street bets and they're going to make you believe that you can also be that person. But for every one of those people, there are a lot of people who are either holding losses or have not made anything at all. So step five, the last step is keep learning, keep educating yourself and reevaluating your investment strategy. Now, when we're talking about investment strategy, there's a couple broad categories of, let's say, types of investors. So one investment strategy is called dividend growth investing. These people have an obsession with dividend stocks. They exclusively buy stocks that pay out a yield and then they use that yield to buy more shares and use the more yield to buy more shares and let it snowball over time until eventually they have enough money being paid out in dividends per year that they can live and they don't have to work anymore. I have a complete video on dividends on my channel uh, that I think is quite good if I do say so myself. I'll link it down below if you're interested in anything to do with dividend stocks. The second broad category of investing is called value investing. And this is where you are looking for companies that are undervalued compared to their intrinsic value of what they should actually be valued at. I think the you know hallmark value investor is probably Keith Gill, the guy who made like $40 million recently on GameStop and bought it when he believed that it was undervalued. Um, I think he's, his username on Reddit is deep effing value and he just like basically has stopped posting the guys like a multi-millionaire and he's probably living it up on some exotic island good for him like amazing but that's like you know the extreme example of deep of value investing is you're looking for those companies that are trading well below what they should be based on fundamentals you know you go in and you wait for them to recover to where they should be and then you rinse and repeat a lot of value investing tends to be tied in with dividend investing a lot of the times these two are the same types of companies uh, but nevertheless it's technically a a different strategy, especially these deep value investors like Keith Gill. The third type of investing is called index investing. And this is where you say, screw it. I'm not interested in picking individual stocks. This is not for me. I have better things to do with my time. I'm going to buy the broad market. I'm going to be very happy with my seven to 10% per year. Some years are going to be greater than that. Some years are going to be less. And I'm going to retire very happy, low fees, no problem. Uh, this works for me. And you know, it's a great strategy and there's nothing you can say wrong against it other than it's boring as hell. And you make a lot of money over time. And the last broad category in terms of investing philosophy and strategy would be growth investing. And this is where you're investing in companies that are growing rapidly in their infancy. They may not yet be profitable. Their balance sheets may look terrible right now, but based on what you think they're going to accomplish in the future, you think the stock prices are going to be significantly higher um, at some point in the future. You know, this would be like, you know, the, the 2010 to 2020 Amazon, the 2010 to 2020 Apple, and probably in my opinion, the 2020 to 2030 Tesla. So, uh, you know, these, as far as, um, these stocks definitely have, I would say the biggest potential for gains. However, they also tend to be the most volatile and can scare, um, can scare beginners if you're kind of starting out with these types of stocks, but no doubt about it. You know, if you pick the right company and you get in early in their um, growth cycle, there's definitely a lot of money to be made with this strategy as well. So, you know, over time you'll figure out kind of where you lean. Actually, there's one more philosophy and it's called YOLO investing. And this is a, a strategy where you basically go all in on a speculative asset. You're the one in a million people who happens to be right and you make like $20 million in one year from a $500 investment and then you retire and go buy a private island. Now this strategy is basically akin to winning the lottery. Um, you know, you don't go out and try to win the lottery. It just kind of happens to you by accident. So. Um, you know, proceed with caution with this, with this strategy. Uh, you know, it doesn't, doesn't work out for a lot of people, but anyhow, those are basically the main strategies. And, you know, over time you'll figure out where your 
inclination is um, in terms of what you, what types of investments you prefer over time. But again, the only way to know that is to get started and kind of figure out what stocks scratch your back the right way and which, which type of investing strategy is for you. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something. If you're interested in hearing more about investing for financial independence with actionable tips and how-to videos, then please subscribe to my channel and like this video. I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.